have her speak. Join me in welcoming Kamika. Good evening. from which I graduated, the district I worked with and researched. It saddens me to the point of grief. I find myself in mourning for the school district of Philadelphia and for Philly as a whole. This is not a pleasant time for us. In my estimation, this could very well be the worst time in the history of the district since it began in 1818. Let me take a moment to fill you in on what's been happening here. When I was early in my teaching career, a former state superintendent of Maryland schools was leading Philly's public schools. He had a plan for increasing the educational opportunities available to our students, but he didn't have the money to enact the plan, nor could he get the money to fully fund it. He forged ahead and funded his program the best he could, believing the money would come. He found that the state had not been giving Philly's public schools its fair share of funding, and after fighting with the state for those funds, he threatened to close all schools in Philadelphia in April instead of June if the state didn't give the district the money it needed to continue operating. The state provided Philly with the money with one condition. That superintendent had to resign. And so he fell on his sword. He left, and the district got the money it needed to make it to the end of the school year. The next year, fresh out of this fight, the state disbanded Philly's public school board, which was believed to be politically entrenched and fiscally irresponsible. They replaced it with a governor-appointed school reform commission. The state takeover of our schools was supposed to restore fiscal solvency, eliminate political wrangling, and bring efficiency to the school district of Philadelphia. Since the state takeover in 2001, we have had two superintendents who implemented new initiatives, new reforms, and new curricula. In fact, Teach for America coming to Philly 10 years ago was one of those new initiatives and effort toward reform. But both of those superintendents have left Philadelphia under the shroud of financial irregularities tallied in the millions of dollars. Last fall, Philly brought in its third superintendent since the state takeover of our schools. Faced with yet another budget shortfall upwards of $300 million and no longer in good enough financial standing to borrow the money, our new superintendent and the School Reform Commission decided to close 20 schools and to lay off almost 4,000 educators. These school closures impact mostly black students and low-income communities. And those laid off educators are almost every assistant principal Counselor, nurse, secretary, aide, and some teachers 
in our district schools. And under this new budget, our district school programs will include no art, no music, no sports. It was painful to see how educators in schools were pitted against one another as they begged the School Reform Commission not to close their schools, as they implored them to take the limited resources our district has from one school and give them to another. It hurts my heart to know that we are closing schools in neighborhoods that need strong education like they need oxygen to breathe and water to drink. And the district schools receiving hundreds of new students will have no assistant principals or counselors or secretaries or nurses or aides to work with the principals and teachers to make sure students' transitions are peaceful and possible. If you can't tell yet, despite the 12 years of the school district of Philadelphia being under the control of the state, the political entrench entrenchment and fiscal malfeasance still exists. And now the state has allocated an additional $400 million to build a new prison for Philadelphia residents. Our schools are $300 million in the hole, but we have $400 million for a new prison. This is why I'm in mourning for my city and for our public schools. While our, our mayor goes on national television and says the School Reform Commission made the right decision with this budget, and it's unfathomable cuts. Let me be the person to stand here tonight and tell you that at this time in our history, it is immoral and unethical to operate public schools without assistant principals, counselors, nurses, aides. And while our superintendent has closed door meetings to reassure counselors that he won't open schools in the fall without them, it's just plain, flat out, unequivocally wrong to use the lives of these educators and the students, families, and communities they serve as pawns for political gaming. This is why I am in mourning. I see them closing schools. I see them laying off educators. I see them building prisons. This is why I am in mourning. The situation with which we are currently faced is a man-made disaster. Too many people in positions of power lack the will to ensure a better education for our students. This is why I am in mourning. But yet, while I grieve, I still dare to hope. While I see them closing schools and building prisons, I also see our students organizing school walkouts and rallies fighting the district, the city, the state. Our students are demanding that someone invest in their learning instead of their incarceration. Demanding that they not remove their teachers so they can learn. Demanding that they not remove their counselors so they can prepare for college. Demanding they not remove their secretary so someone can maintain records. Demanding they not remove their aid so someone can help keep the peace. I am grieving for my city, and I am mourning what is happening to and in our district. But in spite of all this, I still dare to have hope. I have hope because I approach this work from an ethos of love and possibility, from a deep belief that resurrection is possible and no failure is final. What's happening here right now does not look good. But because I have hope, I can say with certainty that no matter what it looks like, greater is coming. Discouragement comes, but we can't let it stay. We can't let ourselves get tired of doing what's right. I still have faith that our collective humanity and our commitment to this work can triumph and defeat our fear, our fatigue, and our frustration. So what does all this have to do with you? You may only be here for the next five weeks. And even if you are staying in Philly, you will probably not teach in district schools anyhow. But Philly is just a microcosm of what's happening in every major urban district around this nation. And for every effort being made to write off our communities and the education we deserve as hopeless and pointless, 
There are equal and opposite efforts being made to learn, to teach, to lead, to shift what we see happening in our communities and what we believe is possible for our schools and our students. Your job is to be part of that equal and opposite effort. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that not everyone is excited that you're here. People around the nation remain confused at how districts can lay off experienced educators while continuing to bring in new Teach for America Corps members. But regardless about how that happens, the fact is you are here. What you do and what you learn matters most while you're here. Your motives matter. Your humility matters. Your listening matters. Your questions matter. As you move through your institute experience for the next few weeks, I want you to constantly ask yourself some questions. For what greater purpose and to what ends do you occupy this space? I know you've been recruited to join Teach for America so you can fight educational inequity, but your motives matter. Why is it that you do what you do? We don't need another hero. We don't need another person looking to pad a resume. We don't need another We don't need another crop of self-righteous do-gooders looking to use their students as springboards to their real careers. We need lifelong educators who are focused on collective responsibility and the greater good. What is the greater good to which your work speaks and for which your work aims? If you aren't focused on the greater good, the short-term work and the long-term implications of your work. In your classroom, at your school, in your community, across your city, your focus is off. While you are here, work on your focus. Examine yourself. Whether it's during the time you're here at Institute or once you're in your regions, whether it's in year one, year two, year five, or year 14, we need educators who will somehow take the good with the bad, the bitter with the sweet, and believe that it will all somehow work together for good. We need people who will see what is, imagine something better, and work for what's best. We need you to have hope and to examine yourself. We need you to ask questions, but we also need you to listen. Never pass up a good opportunity to be quiet. You are here to serve and you are here to learn. And only then can and should you teach. We need you to examine yourself. We need you to be kinder than you should be, nicer than you have to be, and more gentle than you think is wise. Last year, I met with an assistant principal who had been forced transferred to her school mid-year, and she wasn't sure if she would be able to remain at her school when the year ended. But she was fighting to keep a Teach for America core member at her school and from being laid off. With all the turbulence happening in urban schools around the nation, you don't know what educators are dealing with. We need you to commit to treating colleagues, students, and families better than you're treated. We need you to examine yourself. We need you to be servant leaders, not self-serving saviors. when it's not working. We need you to be faithful. We need you to faithfully sow your seeds in your students. We, you, may not, you may not see what you're looking for, but we need you to keep working anyway. We need you to have hope. We don't know what seeds we're planting or how those seeds will grow, but we need you to keep working anyway. We need you to surrender to the process and try all over again after every disappointment, every setback, and every failure. We need you to have hope. We need you to examine yourself. We need you to learn, to understand, to know, and to believe that greater is coming. And we need you to work toward and to be that greater. Thank you.